Good morning, everybody. Today I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the work I've been doing at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, trying to develop an analytical tool to really remove the ambiguity from uh, this technique of ambient noise interferometry, which folks at observatories are really interested in as a forecasting tool for eruptions. So I thought I would start. I thought I would start with um, let me put my laser pointer on. Great. I thought I would start quickly just with a little background on ambient noise and then get into how ambient noise interferometry works and then give you a sense for kind of the state of the art right now in terms of uh, understanding ch changes in seismic velocity associated with volcanic eruptions. So let's start with what ambient noise is, or in my case, what the ambient noise signal is that I'm sort of honing in on. Uh, for me, I'm really interested in using ocean swells, which are these really repeatable seismic sources that uh, you constantly have ocean swells going on. They're constantly coupling with the ocean floor and creating this ongoing signal through time that's occurring all over the world. So we have this signal that's traveling through the world continuously. And so obviously that's really tempting to use for looking for temporal changes uh, at active systems such as uh, volcanic regions. So what are ambient noise cross correlations? That's the kind of bread and butter of this technique. So let's get into that a little. Uh, here's a nice example uh, that I found uh, online. There's two stations. Here's seismometer one, seismometer two. They're each recording ambient noise going on. So you see all these wiggles happening on both those seismometers. If we cross correlate them or match the wiggles, what we end up with is something which you see here in the top panel. This is called a correlation function. And it's going to represent the Earth's structure for some crustal volume between these two stations. So everything we do as we look at these correlation functions is looking at how is this crustal volume changing with time between any two seismic stations that we'll be looking at? So here's ambient noise interferometry in a nutshell. Let's look in our left-hand panel. We have a nice quiet volcano with two seismometers on it. We're going to cross correlate the ambient noise that's being recorded on those two seismometers. And we're gonna get our correlation function uh, which you see in this top panel. Now, this quiet period of time uh, is going, the correlation function for this quiet period of time is going to be shown as uh, this dashed line. So it's hard to see in the overall picture of the correlation function, but if we look at these zoomed in figures of the early time and later time in our correlation function, you can see this dashed line here. That represents our earth structure during a quiet period of time between these two stations on this quiet volcano. Now let's say that we have intrusion of magma into the system. Well, that's gonna cause some changes in our volcanic edifice. Not only do we have magma moving into the system, but we also have, uh, we also have the opening of fractures as this magma moves into the, um, the shallow part of the summit. And so all of that is going to work to cause some changes or slowdowns in the edifice as seismic noise, noise travels between the two stations. So what's gonna happen is that your correlation function, as long as things haven't changed too much material-wise in this edifice, the, the correlation function is going to look really similar, except that it's going to be a slowed down version of that reference period. And so you can see that here as this solid line which is offset in time from our quiet period of time. So we wanna capitalize on this offset between this reference or quiet period of time and the current period of time. So how can we do that? So we'll measure the offset between those two correlation functions and we can plot those differences in time uh, at each center time that we measure them at. So let's say 13 and a half seconds, we measure some lag and then moving further on in the correlation function. 
and we get this uh, we get this line, and that line has a slope, and the negative of that slope equals the change in seismic velocity occurring in the subsurface relative to that reference time period. So it's a simple relationship. I won't really get into it, but the idea is we're measuring these lags. And then from those measurements, we get at what are the changes in seismic velocity that are happening between these two stations in this particular region. So this is one of the earliest studies using this technique at a volcanic system. This was a study in 2009 by Dupatel et al. looking at Piton de la Fournaise. And uh, the plot on the top here that shows changes in seismic velocity with time is going to reflect changes occurring between these two stations here near the volcanic, uh, uh, excuse me, near the summit. And the big observation in this paper was that preceding eruptions, which are shown as these gray periods here, the authors showed slowdowns or decreases in these in seismic velocity. And you could think of that from the example I just showed where near to the intrusion of magma, we had not just that intrusion, but also the opening of fractures and all of that working to slow down the energy as it travels across the edifice. Uh, so, that was a really remarkable result and started getting volcano observatories interested in using this technique for forecasting volcanic eruptions. And you know, while that result is interesting, it's also using hindsight where we know when the eruptions happened. And so it's much easier than to say that this particular velocity slowdown, let's say between these two stations, uh, was suggestive of impending eruption. But we need to also consider that at a volcanic system, you don't just have changes in velocity happening in the subsurface due to volcanic activity, but there are also seasonal changes going on. So depending where you are geographically, you might have just variations in annual rainfall, or you might also have snowpack and snow melt. And all that precipitation is going to percolate into the subsurface and cause seasonal changes in seismic velocity. So there's a nice paper that was released in 2014 by Hodevec Ellis, looking at changes in seismic velocity related to seasonal variations. So let's look at this. Um, we'll look at this top left panel here. This is station at HSR at Mount St. Helens. And near to it, there was a snow tail site uh, that you were able to get from that, the snow load. Uh, so the light gray lines represent changes in seismic velocity for a single year over multiple years when there were no eruptions happening at the volcano. And then the solid dark line represents the mean change in seismic velocity. And what you can see is there's significant changes in seismic velocity simply due to seasonal variations, um, seasonal variations in the hydrologic cycle. Uh, and that's evidenced by the fact that here plotting snow load, for example, you see that when uh, this dashed line, excuse me, represents the snow load, you can see that when you get to really peak or high levels of snow load, so a lot of snow on the surface, you're loading that surface and closing fractures and then seeing a resulting increase in seismic velocity. And then conversely, as we have snow melt and the diffusion of that melt into the subsurface, uh, you're opening pore spaces and fractures and causing these slowdowns in velocity. Uh, the thing that strikes me in looking at this plot is that uh, these values aren't perfectly repeatable every year. And in fact, there's quite a bit of scatter and a lot of that is due to the fact that you don't have the same snow load or rainfall every year. And those variations are gonna cause differences in your determined changes in seismic velocity in these seasonal time periods. Uh, so why is that important? Well, in, in looking for changes in seismic velocity associated with volcanic eruptions, we wanna know when our changes are departing from some sort of seasonal or background level and moving into showing that there's something additional going on, perhaps volcanic activity. So this bottom panel here shows an eruption in 2013. 
Uh, this red line indicates the onset of the 2013 eruption at, uh, this is Benyaminoff volcano in Alaska. Uh, you see a bunch of rainbow colored lines in the background. These represent changes in seismic velocity happening in an inter-eruptive period. So associated with variations in the hydrologic cycle. And again, you can see that they overall have some correspondence to one another, but have significant scatter. Now the blue dots show changes in seismic velocity that were occurring leading up to the 2013 eruption. And what you can see is that for this eruption, which was a pretty big one, I think a VEI of about three, you have a significant departure from background or seasonal changes. And you can really see the slowdown in velocity uh, in this case, uh, in this region here at this station, as we lead into that 2013 eruption. And if every volcano behaved like this, it would be easy enough and we wouldn't have to then consider these um, other than plotting in background, we wouldn't really have to consider beyond that these changes, these seasonal changes in seismic velocity. Um, however, uh, this sort of beautiful looking relationship is not always the case. Um, for example, let's look here in the top panel. Uh, this was a smaller eruption in 2004 at the same volcano. And again, uh, in this case, the red line represents the onset of the 2004 eruption. Seasonal changes in velocity due to uh, variations in the hydrologic cycle are shown again in rainbow colored. And then these blue dots represent changes in seismic velocity in the time approaching the 2004 eruption. Uh, now, as someone who works in an observatory, if I'm looking at these changes in seismic velocity, these blue dots, and I'm thinking in terms of volcanic activity, this background level of changes in seismic velocity due simply to seasonal changes uh, is very close to what I'm observing in this, say this current day point. It would be really hard for me to look at this and this point in reference to this background, these background changes and, and get anything from that in terms of a warning of impending eruption. And so, Really, the, the work here is to resolve these sorts of ambiguities in order to have more clear cut and kind of uh, statistically accurate views of when, when our changes in seismic velocity in the current day are really departing from the changes we would expect just due to seasonal changes like rain and snowpack. So there's been some work done with this, looking at trying to model poor fluid pressure changes in the subsurface, and then mapping those poor fluid pressure changes to changes in seismic velocity that would be expected uh, due to those pressure changes. So this is a study by Rouvet et al. in 2015. I'm not going to get into this equation. It's pretty complex. Um, basically, it's trying to model poor fluid pressure changes due to rainfall, both due to the diffusion of that rainfall into the subsurface, as well as the loading of the surface due to the rainfall initially. So in this case, they're modeling the 1D poor fluid pressure across Piton de la Fournaise. Uh, this is a very popular volcano for testing these sorts of methods because it has a very impressive network. Uh, in this case, they're using rainfall measured at this single station, the single meteorological station here. Uh, here's the summit of uh, Piton de la Fournaise. And so from that single station, they're trying to extrapolate the fluid, poor fluid pressure changes across the whole region. Uh, additionally, using this sort of poor fluid pressure modeling, you have to not only measure take into account, excuse me, take into account rainfall, but you also need to assume something about the subsurface in terms of its geophysical parameters, such as hydraulic diffusivity. You need to understand how that water, rainwater is diffusing into the subsurface. Um, so there, there are some, some challenges to using this and some assumptions you need to make in using this sort of method to estimate for fluid pressure. Uh, so these authors looked at modeling poor fluid pressure using rainfall between 2011 
2014. So here's the rainfall that they measured at that single meteorological station. And then using this equation at the top uh, that I showed you in the last slide, they then uh, modeled what the expected pore fluid pressure would be in the subsurface due to that rainfall. So here's their pore fluid pressure model zoomed in for this period where there were no eruptions happening at Piton de la Fournaise. And then that's in the top panel. And then the lower panel shows the changes in seismic velocity that they determined for that time period. And they show some basic correspondence spatially between the two models. So as you go up in changes in seismic velocity in this shorter time span, you see an increase in pore fluid pressures. Uh, as you see this sort of longer term decrease in pore fluid pressure, you see this longer term decrease in seismic velocity. Uh, and you see that sort of simple correspondence across this whole interruptive time period. So I won't go into the specifics, but they take, just backing up, they take this pore fluid pressure model and the observed changes in seismic velocity for this interruptive period. And assuming that the changes in seismic velocity are due strictly to that pore fluid pressure model, they then use a transfer function to relate the predicted pore fluid pressure to an observed change in seismic velocity. And so then from that, they can correct for the rainfall that they measure in the region. So this top panel on the right shows, this is, these are changes in seismic velocity uh, on the y-axis with time on the x-axis. Each of these red lines represents an eruption. The top panel shows the changes without rainfall accounted for. And then the bottom panel shows when they've accounted for rainfall and subtracted out those changes in seismic velocity due to precipitation. It's hard to get an idea for the impact of this sort of work without sort of zooming in. So here again, the top panel is the uncorrected changes in seismic velocity. And then the bottom panel are those changes in seismic velocity with rainfall effects sort of subtracted out. Uh, so it's really actually very impactful, this sort of work. Uh, so here's an eruption that happened in 2014. And uh, in this case, they've, flip their y-axis. So as we go up, we're decreasing seismic velocity. So you can see that they're decreasing seismic velocity approaching the eruption. But if you think of this in an observatory setting, it would be really challenging to see this decrease in seismic velocity as anything significant in terms of impending eruption when we can look back on other periods without eruption and see the same sort of magnitude of changes. So that's sort of the, ambigu the ambiguity that I'm talking about between precipitation-based changes in seismic velocity and those changes in seismic velocity due to volcanic activity. However, once you correct for rainfall, you see that those changes in this region here were due to poor fluid pressures and you get kind of a leveling out of those changes. But then as you approach this 2014 eruption, what remains is what must be volcanic changes in seismic velocity or decreases approaching the eruption. So by accounting for precipitation, we can start to really clarify or remove any sort of ambiguity and start to see those changes due to some sort of impending volcanic activity. Uh, this study actually focuses on uh, earthquake activity using changes in seismic velocity in Northern Japan. Mostly, I just wanted to point out that, again, much like that uh, Hodevec Ellis paper from earlier, in this study, they're showing that outside of times of um, earthquakes, shown as these dashed lines, you see more seasonal changes in seismic velocity from year to year that can be pretty different from one another. So between 2009 and 2010, you have a really beautiful parabolic shape to your changes in seismic velocity. But then the next year, uh, things look quite different and it's actually quite flat through the year. Uh, again, looking a little, oh, there we go. Looking a little further out in another period when there wasn't any sort of activity going on besides seasonal changes, uh, you see even a very different shape to our changes in seismic velocity. So 
it's important not to just plot these in background, but because they can vary so much uh, annually, we need to really take into account for that particular time period that you're looking at, what's the precipitation happening and what are the effects in the subsurface due to that particular precipitation at that time. So more recently, there was an interesting paper taking into account the same sort of idea of separating out precipitation from volcanic changes, focused on the 2018 eruption at Kilauea. And again, they applied ambient noise interferometry. Their results focus on a couple station pairs here near the summit of Kilauea, and then a couple more station pairs located in this region here called the Eastern Rift Zone. Uh, this is where Puo, the vent that sourced the 2018 eruption was located. I just wanted to stop and show some really beautiful pictures of the eruption. Here's Puo with a fusion of lava happening during this event, and then a close-up um, of, the, of the vent. Okay, so as I said, we're going to look at four different pairs of station, uh, four different station pairs, two near to the summit and two sampling near to where the eruption happened in the eastern rift zone. Uh, in this case, the authors are plotting precipitation as the solid blue line. They're using a 31 day stack of precipitation in their plots. And then they're also plotting the changes in seismic velocity for these different station pairs. So the solid blue line is going to represent precipitation. The two red lines in this plot are going to represent changes in seismic velocity occurring near Kilauea summit. And then the solid green lines are going to show changes in seismic velocity occurring within the eastern rift near to where the eruption is, uh, will happen. So the basic feature the authors want to draw your eye to is that as we have increases in seismic velocity, we see Oh, and I should point out again, these authors have also flipped their y-axis so that as we go up the y-axis, we're decreasing seismic velocity. So the, the basic idea to first order is that we have increasing precipitation, we see decreases in seismic velocity, uh, and then conversely, as we see decreases in, in precipitation, we have increases in seismic velocity. And that's just sort of a first order trend that they see in their data. So then the authors took the next step, and I think this is rather clever, of plotting each of these time steps and the change in seismic velocity for whatever the particular pair was with respect to the precipitation at that time. And so you end up with these scatter plots. This left-hand panel shows changes in seismic velocity occurring near Kilauea summit, and the colors reflect different time periods. So green reflects the inter-eruptive time period, blue represents co- and post-eruptive time, and the pre-eruptive time period is shown in red. And one of the biggest and most important observations they make is that when they fit a linear regression, which maybe isn't exactly great, there is a bit of quite a bit of scatter here, but when they do a linear regression for each of these time periods, they find that the slope of the line for the inter-eruptive period is the same as that of the co- and post-eruptive period for changes in velocity versus precipitation. So what this means is that the effects of precipitation are the same during an inter-eruptive period of time as they are during these co- and post-eruptive period periods of time. And that's really important. And again, it's highlighting that we really do need to consider precipitation when we evaluate these changes in seismic velocity that we solve for in time in order to understand what volcanic activity they might be suggestive of. Uh, another sort of observation from, from this graph is that there's a downshift uh, in, this, in um, the x-intercept for the line. So the co-eruptive line plots overall lower, it's downshifted from the inter-eruptive time period. So that makes sense to us, the velocities within that region are slowing down relative to the interruptive time period. And that could be due to all sorts of different uh, changes and fracturing near the summit due to that um, 2018 eruptive activity. Once you get to about 200 meters of precipitation, this relationship falls off and you get into more of a scattershot sort of observation. Uh, in this case, 
even though we are in sort of a scatter shot distribution, what we see is that the pre-eruptive points plot within the inter-eruptive points. Um, so not much else uh, to, say there, to say there. Looking now at station pair sampling within the Eastern Rift Zone up here where the eruption was happening, a very similar relationship where we see at 200 meters of millimeters of precipitation or less, we see the same slope in our changes in seismic velocity versus precipitation for the inter-eruptive time period versus the co- and post-eruptive time periods. So again, in this region where we have active effusion happening, uh, we see the same sort of importance of precipitation in this co- and post-eruptive time relative to the inter-eruptive time. And again, we see this downshift in the x-intercept and overall we have slower or decreasing changes in seismic velocity during this co- and post-eruptive time period. And again, that makes sense with all this extensive intrusion uh, and fracturing that we have during the eruption. Uh, after 200 millimeters of precipitation, again, this linear trend falls off. And we see that our pre-eruption and inter-eruptive points uh, plot relatively within the same region as one another, although these authors argue that overall there is something of a shift such that the pre-eruption time period shows increasing seismic velocity relative to the inter-eruptive period. I think that's a little hard to see, um, but uh, I'm willing to entertain the idea that as we have inflation near to Kuo, uh, we get extension and uh, slowdowns in velocity in that region, and then immediately adjacent to that area where these um, eastern rift zone pairs are sampling, uh, we have compression due to the effects of that inflation nearby. So it, it you know, it could be, but I think overall. Uh, the, the conclusion from all these studies is that we need to be accounting for precipitation when we're using this technique to forecast changes in seismic velocity associated with uh, possible volcanic activity. Uh, and so here I'm just showing again that that plot from the Rive et al. paper where we saw that by taking out these precipitation-based changes in seismic velocity, suddenly we could clarify when the changes occurring like this velocity slowdown might be suggestive of impending volcanic eruption, which occurs here as this red line. However, in summarizing this kind of state of the art in thinking about precipitation effects, uh, these sorts of tools can be challenging. So for example, using that scatter plot would be really difficult in, a, in an observatory setting just due to the pure sort of uh, scatter of those points. Uh, it would be really ambiguous to use that as sort of an eruption forecasting tool. In terms of using these more elaborate sort of 1D pore fluid pressure modeling um, approaches, that can be challenging as well. So for example, that study at Piton de la Fournaise, they had a single station measuring rainfall, and then from that extrapolated out pore fluid pressure changes for the whole region. And you can imagine that as you get to bigger and bigger volcanic systems, uh, you're going to need more high resolution precipitation data to then be able to more accurately constrain pore fluid pressure changes and then from that the resulting changes in seismic velocity due to those pore fluid pressure changes. Um, so that's one limitation is that really most volcanoes aren't going to have a ton of rainfall data to be able to include that sort of uh, sophistication. Additionally, as I talked about before, you need to know something or assume something about the subsurface in terms of physical parameters. So for example, hydraulic diffusivity, uh, you need to assume that uh, for this region. And then if that's varying spatially, that's a whole nother complexity that you need to fold in. Uh, so for me, all of this proves that considering precipitation when forecasting volcanic eruptions is really important, but I want to have a method that decouples from those limitations of needing rain gauges, snow tell sites, needing to assume things about the physical properties of the subsurface. Uh, so I've been working on a new method uh, to do this sort of analysis of our ambient noise changes at Kilauea volcano. Uh, and I've been looking in real time at the 2020 and then the ongoing Kilauea eruptions. Uh, so here is just a beautiful picture. Uh, this is 
Pale Mau Mau Crater within Kilauea. This is our active lava lake. In 2018, this completely drained due to the 2018 eruption. And in 2020, uh, this area was filled with water until the onset of the 2020 eruption, at which point we had the resurgence of our lava lake. So I just think it's lovely to show uh, the resurgence of the lava lake. And interestingly enough, with our ongoing eruption at Kilauea, the level of the lava lake has become so high that now it can and very often does overflow this region and then spill out onto the caldera floor. So come visit, I guess is what I'm saying. Okay, so here's my network of stations across Kilauea volcanic system. This is the summit. This is Hale Mau Mau, where our active lava lake now is. If you look here, you can see all these craters that sort of roughly outline the eastern rift zone. Uh, in particular, this was the site of the 2018 eruption. And so every day I go through and I have the computer calculate changes in, in seismic velocity across all of these uh, station pairs. So I have a few examples here. Uh, these are showing some stations in this region, some station pairs, excuse me, in this region here. And I've outlined when, or I've indicated when the 2020 eruption and 2021 eruption occurred. Each of these was preceded by intrusive events uh, in the area. So we have this interruptive period where we see changes in seismic velocity with time. And then for these stations that lie relatively near to the eruption, you, you do see pronounced slowdowns in seismic velocity. And that's really nice, but that's really only true for these few stations. And when I consider all my stations, trying to get kind of a big picture view, uh, many of the stations in this region show certainly slowdowns, but they're very ambiguous when I look at them in reference to some seasonal or background changes in seismic velocity. And so in terms of forecasting in an observatory setting, again, I need to remove that amb ambiguity so that I understand definitively if there's strong evidence uh, suggesting impending eruption. So I've gone a different way and tried to uh, use something a little bit more simple to consider these seasonal or precipitation-based changes in seismic velocity. And specifically, I've been using uh, something called empirical orthogonal function analysis, or EOFs. And EOFs, the whole basic idea is we're looking for what patterns are meaningful in our temporal data when we flatten the dimensions. And so really some dimensions are gonna be more important than others in EOF analysis. And so the um, example I use is watching a football game. So if you're sitting in the stadium, you're seeing the game in 3D, you can identify players, you can identify the ball being thrown and you can understand the game being played. If you go, and go home and turn on your TV and watch the same game, you flatten the dimensions, but you're still able with the same abilities to um, follow the game. So you've flattened out the dimensions that really don't matter. And the ones that are more prominent and show the strong patterns are then kind of thrust to the forefront. And that's the basic idea of EOFs. Uh, so this technique looking for spatial patterns in our temporal data has been used for a long time in climate studies. Um, here's a study in the field of oceanography looking at how sea surface temperatures vary spatially. So again, the idea is we wanna decouple from time and look at within our data, what are the basic patterns that are always there? So we do our EOF analysis and we end up with our set of uh, orthogonal basis functions. And all you need to know is that you have a set of vectors and the first vector in that set is going to find a pattern that captures most of the variance uh, in this sea surface temperature data in this example. And then as you move progressively through this set of vectors, each of the later vectors is gonna show patterns that capture less and less of the uh, variance in this data. Uh, you're also going to get something called the expansion coefficient. And that's going to be for each step in time so that you can take your EOF, this, these basis vectors that you have and multiply them by an expansion coefficient to get back to the time domain for your data. And that's the basic idea. So now. What can we understand from using this sort of approach? So here's that first vector 
in our EOF, in our set of uh, basis, basis functions from our EOF. So this is gonna be the vector that's going to do, that's going to capture most, the most amount of data variance uh, in our sea surface temperature model. Uh, so for the field of oceanography, this was really telling because it showed them how sea surface temperatures were related spatially between the equator and the poles. So for example, if you had warming temperatures at the equator for sea surface, then at the, oh, my, my laser pointer is stuck. Oh, there we go. Uh, then at the poles, you would have cooling temperatures. And then conversely, if you had cooling temperatures at the equator, then at the poles, you would have warming temperatures. So you're able to see a meaningful spatial pattern without needing to think about time. Now here on the right, we're showing these expansion coefficients, and those are really helpful for understanding at some point in time how this spatial pattern works out. So for example, here they're showing, uh, for example, in the late 1880s, you get these, you're in a La Nina year, you get these positive values. So you take that positive value and you multiply it by the spatial pattern, and you see at those periods of time, you have warming at the equator and cooling at the poles. And then conversely, you can look at the time steps during an El Nino year. So for example, 1890, you get this negative weighting value. You multiply it by your spatial pattern and you see that you'll have cooling at the equator and warming at the poles. So that's the basic idea. And that's what I want to use and apply to my relative velocity changes during interruptive periods of time when we're seeing the effects of uh, likely effects of precipitation um, as have been suggested in those prior studies. So we take all of our changes in seismic velocity in this region for this interruptive time period. And here I'm just showing a few examples. Um, so it's this boxed region here preceding those, the two most recent eruptions. So I'm gonna load in all of those interruptive changes with time that I see for all these station pairs. And I'm gonna get uh, my EOF and my expansion coefficients. And I'm gonna look at the first EOF, so that first vector in my set of orthogonal basis functions. And that's the vector that should represent most of the data variance in my uh, changes in seismic velocity during that interruptive period of time. And actually when I do that analysis, I find that that first vector is able to explain 85% of the data variance, which is a strikingly high amount. So this first pattern, is really, is really able to strongly represent or capture most of these uh, interruptive changes in seismic velocity. And there is a basic sort of spatial pattern that we see here. So these are showing all the um, interstation paths that I'm looking at. Uh, basically, we're looking at this region here. And we can see that when we're in this location here across the, um, across the caldera, we have these negative EOF values. And then as we move to the east, we get into a region of positive values. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if we are seeing decreases in seismic velocity in this region, then as we move across the area spatially and we get say over here to this region, we're going to see increases in seismic velocity. And then of course the converse would be true as well. If this region is showing decreases in seismic velocity, as we move across the caldera, we're going to move into a regime of uh, increasing seismic velocity. So now we have a pattern that captures most of the data variance for our interruptive event. Uh, and the hypothesis was that the biggest changes we see in the interruptive period should be due to precipitation. So here's my annual precipitation map for Hawaii. And I'm going to focus in on this region where Kilauea is, and I'm gonna underlay it on my EOF pattern. And what I can see is there really is a strong correspondence between where we have high and low levels of precipitation annually and where we have these positive and negative EOF values. So we can see that in dry regions, we get these really negative EOF values. So the dry areas are oranges and yellows in the background. And then as we move to the east and get into wetter regions of the volcano, we move into this area with positive EOF values. <clears throat> so
So for me, this shows that this first EOF pattern that I've gotten from my analysis is really representative of changes in seismic velocity due to precipitation. So these seasonal effects. Oh, and I should, I do wanna highlight. So when I do this EOF analysis, I get this pattern here that represents most of the data due, most of the changes due to uh, precipitation. I have these expansion coefficients where I can go for each step in time and have a coefficient that I multiply this by to get back the changes, the predicted changes in seismic velocity at that time step. Uh, now, since we're explaining 85% of the data variance and not the full 100%, and I would never expect to actually capture 100%, there's going to be some misfit between the changes in seismic velocity that this uh, seasonal pattern that this seasonal pattern EOF represents, so this guy, um, versus what we actually observe during this interruptive time period. So I wanna quantify that misfit between the two so that I know what are the misfits you would expect predicting seasonal changes using uh, this particular technique. So these are the reasonable misfits that might happen when you assume that the changes are just due to precipitation um, based on this EOF pattern. So we were looking at sort of training our system using interruptive changes in seismic velocity. But what we really wanna get at is, are the changes in velocity we're seeing in the current time period simply due to seasonal changes or due to seasonal changes and something volcanic? So I've put this plot here. This is showing all the different station pairs we're looking at. And we would expect that if we have an eruption happening, it's gonna cause changes in a localized region for just certain station pairs and not all the station pairs uh, in our area of analysis, unless we had some sort of really massive, massive event. But overall, we would expect localized changes in velocity to, due to volcanic effects. And then all these station pairs are going to be affected by seasonal or precipitation-based changes. So if we just, Oh, there we go. So with that in mind, at a particular time step where there might be something volcanic happening, we're going to expect that most of our changes in seismic velocity at that time step would be seasonal and that a lesser amount of them would be influenced by seasonal plus some volcanic changes. And so if we want to find out what the um, expansion coefficient is, we have to take into consideration all those changes in seismic velocity. Um, solving for the expansion coefficient is really a linear regression problem. And so these can be dangerous if we take into account all our changes in seismic velocity with equal weighting. So just to clarify this, um, so for example, if this plot on the left, each of these points represents uh, the precipitation at each particular um, represents, excuse me, not the precipitation, represents changes in seismic velocity for a particular station pair. We would expect the station pairs that are behaving seasonally to all kind of cluster together with like a, a more linear looking behavior because they're all following this particular EOF. And we would expect those areas that are showing both volcanic and seasonal behavior uh, to be more offset from that linear uh, sort of behavior uh, due to the fact that not just seasonal changes are happening, but also volcanic changes are happening. So uh, we want to fit all these points, but we don't want these points where we have both seasonal and volcanic changes influencing uh, the, the expansion coefficient that we get at that time period. So instead of using what would be a classic L2 norm, where all of these changes in seismic velocity have equal weighting, we're going to use an L1 norm where we say those areas in a linear regression that are gonna cause big misfits, we wanna really not ignore, but put a lot less weight or influence into those so that the trend we end up getting is an expansion coefficient that should be uh, jiving with a seasonal time period. And so in the end, if you do this sort of analysis, you can predict what the changes in seismic velocity are going to be across all your station pairs for seasonal behavior only.
And that can be really powerful because now we can start to look at each of these station pairs and see what are our observed changes in seismic velocity, which I'm showing here in this top panel in black. And then what are our predicted changes in seismic velocity due simply to seasonal or precipitation effects? And those are shown in red. And so you can see here, these jive pretty well with one another and plot really similarly to one another. And if I difference them, I can plot those differences in the bottom plot. And those differences between these two lines are shown in the green points. Uh, now what I've done is I've also plotted these red dashed lines. And what those represent are the misfit lines from our histogram. So if you recall from before, we plotted this histogram that showed these are the misfits to basically uh, as good as it gets using this EOF seasonal pattern to predict seasonal changes. So we're not gonna fit the data perfectly, but here's our range of misfits we would expect if we had just seasonal behavior going on at the volcano. And so if our misfits between the observed and predicted lines fall between these two dashed lines, that means we have seasonal behavior. So this is our seasonal zone. These two lines are, are showing where we have just seasonal behavior happening. So this station pair is located between SDH and MPOC. And since we had an eruption up here, this area is really quite far from the eruption and should just be reflecting seasonal changes in seismic velocity. So it's not a big surprise that when we look at the predicted versus observed changes, we see misfits that plot within this seasonal box. But if we look at some of the pairs, oh, I should have put the, uh, a picture of the uh, summit. I'll just quickly go back. We're, now we're gonna look at some pairs in this region here near to the eruption, we expect that those areas are, are, they shouldn't really behave seasonally, just seasonally, they should show also effects of volcanic activity. So we can see that first in this interruptive period of time, we have predicted, uh, the predicted red line shows seasonal changes and then the black line shows what our observed changes are. We see that the misfits fall into that seasonal uh, box. Now, as we get closer to the 2020 eruption, we see that we're moving outside of this box of seasonal trend and instead moving to areas that indicate that the misfits between these two lines show that our observed changes are slower than would be predicted in a seasonal time period. And that's the case both preceding the 2020 eruption in the co-eruptive time period and then uh, leading into uh, the 2021 eruption. And that's the same case for this other plot you see here on the right, where again, as we lead into the 2020 eruption, we're departing from our seasonal behavior and going into misfits that indicate slower velocities than would be expected if it was just seasonal changes going on at the volcano. So we're able to figure out uh, using this technique when we have behavior that's seasonal and when we're moving outside of that seasonal behavior. But in terms of where these misfits plot relative to uh, seasonal misfits that we might expect, we can also gleam whether that particular station pair is an extension or compression. So for example, for this particular station pair, as we approach the 2020 eruption, we have misfits that indicate that our velocities are slower than would be expected in a seasonal time period. That would indicate then that that particular station pair is an extension. Conversely, if we saw that our misfits indicated we had uh, faster than seasonal uh, changes in seismic velocity, we would expect that that particular station pair then would be in compression. So now we can start to look at the bigger volcanic system and try to identify where we have uh, where we have in interstation paths that are outside of a seasonal trend, how many of the stations are showing that outside of seasonal trend and where they're occurring. So this top panel is plotting the number of stations that are falling outside of a seasonal trend. And then this x-axis is time. So here's the 2020 eruption. This is an intrusive event that happened preceding it. We can look, we're in an interruptive time period. And at this time period, there are zero station pairs 
showing changes outside of seasonal behavior. So all these black lines here show that spatially, any black line indicates just seasonal behavior happening between those two stations. If we march a little closer to the start of that eruption, we can see that we start to get changes in seismic velocity that are outside of the seasonal trend. So in this case, these red areas, these red lines are going to represent regions of volumetric extension and then the blue compression. So you can see as we start to get closer to the eruption, uh, at this point, we're about 50 days off. We have a little bit of extension to the Southeast of uh, this is the active lava lake. And then immediately to the Northwest, we see a bit of compression. And this makes sense if you think about shallow sources of inflation. And there was a nice paper by Donaldson et al where they modeled the micro strain, uh, the volumetric strain due to shallow inflation. So here we have our inflating source. And so immediately above it, we have a red region indicating extension. And then as we move out away from the source, we move into compression surrounding that inflating source. And so you can imagine then that we have some sort of inflating source generically in this region, what with the fact that we are observing extension here and then compression further to the Northwest. So again, let's move just a little bit closer. Now we're about two weeks from the eruption. And again, you're seeing even more extension happening near the summit. And then to the Northwest again, we're in compression. So we can imagine that inflating source might becoming lar be becoming larger um, in, um, might become larger, sorry. Okay, now we are one day before the 2020 eruption and we see now that the summit is in, there's a large region of extension happening across the entirety of the summit. And then the eruption occurs. Now I'm gonna jump uh, to May of 2021, following the eruption. This was the time period when we called the 2020 eruption over based on the simple definition that we saw no effusion at the surface. Uh, so, but regardless of that, we can see from this uh, figure down below that we had a number of, air, of stations showing extension across the summit and then further to the north compression, indicating that there was still ongoing inflation and possible intrusion of magma. Uh, however, at the surface, we weren't observing um, any sort of volcanic activity, but that doesn't mean that the volcano wasn't poised and ready to erupt again. Okay, here we are looking uh, about 20 days before the 2021 eruption. And again, we're seeing extension in this area here near Hale Mau Mau at the summit, surrounded by regions of compression. So again, we're still having some sort of inflating volcanic source that seems to be occurring as evidenced by this plot. And then as we get closer, that pattern continues and we see that then the eruption happens about a day later. So this EOF analysis uh, for me is a really strong new tool for analyzing current changes in seismic velocity and separating out changes due to any sort of precipitation and really honing in on changes that might be more volcanic in nature. Uh, the technique is removing the need for any sort of uh, gauges representing precipitation. So you don't need rain gauges or snow tell sites. All you need are changes in seismic velocity occurring during an interruptive time period. Additionally, you don't need any knowledge of the subsurface. You don't need to make any assumptions there, like what's the hydraulic diffusivity. Uh, again, you're just using these interruptive changes to try and form a model for how precipitation uh, affects the subsurface. Uh, additionally, I think a power to this is that you can account for precipitation at all your different stations uh, because of the nature of this technique, again, without needing a rain gauge at every site. Um, and then additionally, uh, not only can we separate out precipitation from volcanic changes, but we can start to say something about whether these um, volumes between each of these station pairs is in extension uh, or compression, and then what that can mean in terms of the impending volcanic behavior. So that's pretty much the crux of what I have in terms of the preliminary results um, for this new EOF method. I'm going to end on this beautiful picture taken by one of my colleagues, Hannah Dietrich, showing a beautiful double rainbow going into 
uh, the active lava lake in Hale Malmo. And I'd be happy to take questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nifa. That was a, a fascinating talk. We have had a few questions come in already, but if you're uh, if you have yet to enter your question, please feel free to do so using the Q and A box, and I can um, bring these to Nifa's attention, and we can, we can start working our way through them. The first question here is from Martha Savage, and, and she asks, um, "What do you think explains the change in behavior at high rainfall in Hawaii?" So you showed that scatter plot. And it looked like there was a change in the trend above 200 millimeters uh, precipitation. Do you have any explanation for uh, for that change? Um, I sorry, I'm just going to get out of this so I can actually see your face, Justin. Um, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> yeah. So that uh, particular plot showing. I mean, it must be some sort of saturation effect with pore fluid pressure modeling. That would be my guess as you reach some fully saturated point and then I don't know, perhaps the behavior becomes more complex. I've tried to sort of disengage with having to deal with those sorts of advanced um, pore fluid pressure models by using this particular method. But that would be my guess is that you're hitting a saturation point because the rainfall is so significant over such a short period of time. Um, and then once you hit that saturation point, there's probably uh, more advanced kind of methods or modeling needed for those sort of pore fluid pressure effects. Maybe a, a, related, a related question to that that I had was, you know, it seems like the trend between the co-eruptive or inter-eruptive periods were, was pretty distinct um, below 200 millimeters, but above it, the, you know, pre-eruptive and the inter-event um, interruptive dots, they were pretty commingled. And so I'm wondering, does that mean that this method for detecting changes in seismic velocity would be less able to detect actual changes because of the volcano in a period of very heavy rainfall? So when it's really rainy, does your method become less sensitive? Oh, no, it, it, it shouldn't at all. You can, um, so because you're looking at a very basic spatial pattern, to the precipitation without this correspondence in time, what ends up happening is that you control the effects of higher low levels of rainfall by what that um, expansion coefficient is. So it would change relative to how much or how little rainfall you have. So in okay. yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, okay, another question here from, from William Harbert. He, he asks, can you estimate the total compliant porosity and the percentage of closing of compliant porosity in your model for volume pixels along the ray path. What are those percent? And if so, what are those percentages? Can you repeat that question? Yeah, yeah. No, this is this is a, a tricky one. Um, so he's wondering about the estimate of the total compliant porosity um, and the percentage of closing of that porosity in your model uh, for the the pixels along the ray path. Um, I mean, all I'm really estimating is a total change for an entire crustal volume due to the diffusion of the rainwater into the system. So the, that level of complexity isn't uh, possible for, for this sort of simple approach. Okay. Um, you know, I'm curious, I'm an instrument guy, so I'm curious to know about your network that you're using to do this analysis. And I'm wondering, if you think the seismic network that is at Kilauea now is sufficient for the analysis you've done, I mean, I guess obviously it is because you showed us your results, but I'm just wondering, would additional stations improve, significantly improve your results? And if so, where would you add stations? Yeah, I think we could use more stations across the Eastern Rift Zone. Um, let's see, I can go back to sharing my screen. Oh, am, I am screen sharing, okay. Uh, let me... Yeah, so as you can see, we have a really nice distribution across uh, the summit area, but then as we go through the Eastern Rift Zone, we're, we're just kind of moving along linear, like along this sort of semi-linear feature. And it would be nice if, yeah, we could start to have instruments across this whole region. Yeah. Um, the, the more areas we're sampling, the better sort of spatially we can do predicting what uh, changes in seismic velocity would be associated with precipitation. So. And the better we do at that, then the better we do at removing those effects from the overall system and then predicting what changes are just due to something else like volcanic activity. 
so yeah, for me, I, I would love to put more sort of off Eastern Rift Zone uh, instruments. Maybe um, sticking with the instrumentation theme, you know, the, it, have you compared your seismic results showing periods of extension versus compression with uh, geodetic data? I'm sure you've got all kinds of G GPS stations over the volcano. Do, do the two agree temporally or is there one that sees the signal sooner or better? Yeah, I've started looking at comparing um, not just individual GPS stations, but looking um, if you kind of difference between two GPS stations, you can get like line length changes between the vault uh, across that particular path. So I've started comparing to that. And I do see that when you start seeing the volcano moving into extension, as inferred from, say, a, uh, between two GPS points that seem to be moving apart from one another, you also see within my data um, that we start to see patterns of uh, extension in these uh, changes in seismic velocity. Um, but I haven't done enough that I had anything, uh, I didn't have anything good enough to, to plot here today. But yeah, that's okay. that's like the last bit of this to do is to then tie it to the geodetic observations. Okay. We've got a, a question from Maureen Dinell here. Um, excellent and creative work. If the permeability structure changes during eruption, then DV over V response to precipitation will also differ. Is it possible that the EOF may be actually time dependent if the subsurface structure changes? Have you thought about strategies to account for this? I haven't yet thought about strategies to account for it, but I've definitely thought about that very idea. And in fact, that's why I'm showing today just 2020 and 2021, not only because I was testing them in real time, but also because uh, trying to go back and use this same sort of approach uh, for the 2018 eruption all using the same EOF pattern for precipitation would be kind of a fool's errand because the structure there was changed so much that the permeability, the diffusivity in the ground surface has to be totally different between now and then. Um, in terms of how to approach it, if you have enough significant changes in permeability during the eruption, I'm not sure yet what you would do because the idea is you need to build your spatial pattern and how changes in size and velocity are affected by precipitation without having the effects of anything else going on. So uh, yeah, I don't know how to overcome that limitation yet. Maybe just to clarify too, so it sounds like this method is in active use um, for ongoing monitoring at Kil Kilauea to, um, to forecast eruption. Is that, is that the case? Yeah, I've been so I've been testing it um, at Kilauea during uh, during 2020 and now in the 2021 eruption. Um, have other have other volcano centers adopted similar type monitoring uh, systems that are, are building on this method? No, I mean I'm 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 still testing it and writing up the paper. This is like gotcha. within the this is work within the last six months or so. So it's it's testing right now to see how it does uh, at Kilauea over multiple eruptions. Um, and then um, as we fine tune, then perhaps employing it at other um, observatories, but this is still early days. Great, great. Well, I think we'll, we'll have to leave it there, but I uh, just wanna take a moment to, again, thank Ninfa so much for, um, for, for your time today and for showing us these really exciting results. It's, it's super encouraging and I'll look forward to, to seeing that paper um, on these results as soon as that's out.